it's uh, time to get started again. So why don't you all sit down? So uh, the topic of my second lecture will be entanglement in quantum field theory. And in an idealized version, we'll discuss four topics, which are, first of all, the riesz schleder theorem, which is the result that shows us that quantum field theory states are highly entangled. And second will be relative entropy in quantum field theory. And the third will be the general proof of monotonicity of relative entropy. And the fourth, but we might have not have time for it, is a derivation of the density matrix in Rindler space. So we're going to consider a quantum field theory in Minkowski space-time M with a Hilbert space H that contains a vacuum state omega. So there's an algebra of local operators whose action produces all states from the vacuum or at least all states in what's called a super selection sector. If there are magnetic monopoles, we don't create them with local operators. You can consider this to be more or less the definition of quantum field theory. After all, people started with fields, then they quantized it, and they had an algebra of field operators. And to decide what the Hilbert space had to be, it was something that the operators could act on. So the fact that the local operators can produce all states from the vacuum is basically the definition of quantum field theory. To keep the notation simple, we'll assume the operator algebra is generated by a Hermitian scalar field phi. So states obtained by acting on the vacuum with a series of field operators and arbitrary points in Minkowski space-time are dense in the Hilbert space. The Riesz-Schleder theorem says that actually you get a dense set of Hilbert space states if you restrict the points to any very possibly very small open set. So just restricting to this little open set in M, field operators in U can create a dense set of states. So it's a little surprising at first because it makes all the rest of the field operators seem unnecessary. Now, if this is false, there's a state chi that's orthogonal to whatever you could make by acting on the vacuum with field operators in U. So we're going to show that there's no such chi by showing that any such chi is orthogonal to all such states without the restriction that the x's are in U. So since states created by the phi's are dense, this implies that chi is zero. So assuming that this function vanishes, when the x's are in a small open set, will prove that it actually vanishes even if the x's aren't restricted in that way. So I simply define a function f of the x's by this definition, a matrix element from the vacuum to some state chi of any product of field operators. We're given this function vanishes if the x's are in a small open set. We want to prove it vanishes for all x's. Well, as a first step, we pick a future pointing time-like vector t, and we consider shifting the last point by a real multiple of t. So xn goes to xn plus u times t. So let g of u be the matrix element with xn shifted by u times t. Well, g of u vanishes if u is small enough because then xn plus u times t is still in the open set curly u. Uh, this should be curly u. Also, if h is the Hamiltonian, we can write g of u this way, where I sh shifting the operator by ut means conjugating by e to the i u times the Hamiltonian. And then since the Hamiltonian annihilates the vacuum, we can write g of u this way. But because h is non-negative, it follows from this representation that g of u is holomorphic in the upper half u plane. In other words, if we give u an imaginary positive, positive imaginary part, that only is going to make things smaller. 
So we have a function that's holomorphic in the upper half plane and zero in part of the um, um, real axis. Such a function is actually zero. If it, we knew it was holomorphic on the real axis and not just above the real axis and vanished on a segment of the real axis, we'd say that it has a convergent Taylor series expansion around the point in the interval where it vanishes. And this expansion would have to be identically zero. And then we'd say that a function with a zero Taylor series expansion is zero. We can't quite say that right away because to begin with, g of u is only holomorphic above the real axis. But we can get around this using the Cauchy integral formula. So here's a point in the upper half plane. And we can write g of u by an integral over this contour using a Cauchy integral formula. But since the function is holomorphic in the upper half plane and continuous down here, we can deform so that part of the contour is on the axis. And we can take that part to be in the interval where the function vanishes. So then we get a Cauchy integral formula where we just integrate over this. And then we can take u through and learn that it's holomorphic even down below, and in particular on the axis. So in this way, we prove that such a function g of u is actually 0. So now we know that as long as the first n minus 1 points are in the small open set u, this function still vanishes if xn, the last point, is shifted by a multiple of the time-like vector u. For example, the time-like vector might just point in the time direction in some Lorentz frame. So we've learned we can shift the time coordinate as we want and still have vanishing. Now we do this again, picking another time-like vector t prime and replacing xn prime by xn double prime, plus, which is now xn prime plus u prime times t prime, where u prime is still real and t prime is a different time-like vector. We go through exactly the same steps and learn that we still have vanishing if xn prime is replaced by such an xn double prime. But any point in Minkowski space can be reached from u by zigzagging backwards and forwards in various time-like directions. So we learn that we actually have vanishing with no restriction at all on xn, as long as the first n minus 1 points are in the small open set. So the next step is to remove the restriction on the next to last point. So we pick t as before, a time-like vector. And now we make a common shift of the last two points in the t direction, which means we shift the last two points like this. We shift them both by a common multiple of t, by ut for some real u. And now we look at the corresponding shifted matrix element. And it vanishes for small real u, just as before. And also, it can be written like this, with an insertion of e to the i u h, just as before, but now in a different place, one step to the left. And that implies it's holomorphic in the upper half plane. So it's identically 0 again. So now we repeat the process by shifting the last two points in some other time-like direction. And we learn that our matrix element is 0, with no restriction on the last two points if the first n minus two points are in u. And having gotten this far, we keep going. We next remove the restriction on xn minus 2 by shifting the last three points by a common time-like vector. And after shifting them in the t direction, we shift them back in the t prime direction. And then learn, remove the restriction on xn minus 2. And then we do it over again for the last four points, and so on. So we end up proving the riesz leader theorem. An arbitrary state, more exactly a dense set of states in the vacuum sector, can be created from the vacuum by acting with the product of local operators in any small open set U in M. Yes? So this holomorphicity yes. with respect to U that's entered everywhere? Yes. So is there some assumption on the spectrum or something? We use the fact that the Hamiltonian is bounded below by zero. Okay. 
Well, actually, bounded below would have been good enough, but it's actually bounded below by zero. We use the fact that the operator e to the i uh, as an operator, actually, is holomorphic in the upper half u plane, simply because when u has a positive imaginary part, since the energies are positive, that gives an exponentially damped factor. So what we used, we did not use Lorentz invariance directly. We used the fact that um, the energy momentum in any light-like direction is bounded below by zero. Bounded below would have been good enough, but it's bounded below by zero. So we use the fact that the Hamiltonian is bounded below by zero, but also the Hamiltonian plus epsilon times the momentum is bounded below by zero if epsilon is not too big. We use that fact, second fact, when we shifted in a different time-like direction. So we had not just one direction where we could make this argument, but the argument was good in any time-like direction because the Hamiltonian plus any sufficiently small linear combination of the momenta is still bounded below by zero. We only needed bounded below, but it's bounded below by zero. So that makes this matrix element holomorphic in U in the upper half plane. And holomorphy in the upper half plane together with vanishing on part of the real axis is what we used at every step in this argument. And this little Cauchy integral, oh, sorry, where is it? This little argument with the Cauchy integral theorem, Cauchy integral formula, shows that that's enough to prove vanishing of the function. Is this also kind of a proof of the edge of the wedge theorem? Well, no. We use what you could call the one dimensional edge of the wedge theorem. but. Uh, in one dimension, it's more elementary, which is why I gave the proof here from the Cauchy integral formula. The multidimensional edge of the wedge theorem is a more sophisticated theorem, which is important, but which we won't use in today's lecture, so I will not explain it. You'll find references where the Riesz-Leder theorem is proved invoking the multidimensional edge of the wedge theorem, which makes it sound less elementary than it is. So I made a point of presenting the proof using only the one dimensional version of the theorem, which is elementary. The alternative would have been either to invoke a theorem whose proof you didn't know, or else to give what would have been a rather technical looking proof of the edge of the wedge theorem. Uh, I may have gone too fast to be understandable, but I really only use the Cauchy integral formula in an elementary way. Uh, sorry, I didn't repeat the questions like I was supposed to, but maybe I indicated the questions in answering. So one question had been whether we prove the edge of the wedge theorem. No, we avoided using it. Is there some restriction? I mean, is this set U supposed to be on a space-like surface? U? Supposed no, no, the curly U is an open set in space-time, so it's not on a space-like surface. It's a space-time open set. And there's no side restriction if it can be as more than one? You just saw the proof. I hope you found it convincing. <laughs> Sorry, the question was whether you can be as small as you want. Yes, it's as small as you want, but it's an open set. Speak less. Well, the statement didn't involve other operators. The statement was that operators in the set U, acting on the vacuum, create a dense set of states in Hilbert space. They can cross each other's light cones. There wasn't any unstated restriction. So the question was whether singularities when two operators cross the light cone cause a trouble. Evidently not, because they did cross each other's light cones at some point in this proof. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear all that, sorry. Speak up. I agree that you don't want it to matter. Yes. Yes. But I was just curious if I wrote like some just a bunch of like free fields and they had some like power off all offs with some like x i differences squared. I would imagine that somehow cropping like home would give a like that whole correlation would have some funny pole in But I'm not saying uh, well, careful arguments like Streeter and Whiteman consider some slightly smeared versions of these correlation functions. And then they give a well, they almost give exactly the same proof I said, except they use the edge of the wedge theorem, which I avoided using. Is what? Sorry. The wave pack is kind of spread arbitrarily fast. Uh, 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 the, uh, it, rather than answering directly, let me postpone that question, and I'll state what I think is the intuition. Then you can ask another question if you wish. Where were we? Uh, 
Okay, now we want to discuss the interpretation of this theorem. So first of all, does it contradict causality? So at first sight, it seems unintuitive. Consider a state of the universe that on some initial time slice looks like the vacuum near you, but it contains the planet Jupiter in some distant region, space like separated from you. So let J be a Jupiter operator whose expectation value in a state that contains the planet Jupiter in region V is close to one, but its expectation value is close to zero if there's no planet Jupiter in region V. So the Riesz-Leder theorem says there's an operator X in region V. Ah, oh, sorry. This should be a region, operator X in region U, sorry. Such that the state X omega contains the planet Jupiter in region V. As written, the statement isn't unintuitive. But <laughs> the corrected version, where V is replaced by U, is a little unintuitive. So the surprising thing is that an operator in region U can create the planet Jupiter in region V. So that means the vacuum expectation value of the Jupiter operator is zero because in the vacuum, there's no planet Jupiter in region V with high probability. But if you act on the vacuum with some operator X in region U, then in that state, the Jupiter operator has a large expectation value, close to one, because there's almost definitely a Jupiter planet in region V after acting with operator X in region U. Is this a contradiction? Well. First of all, this matrix element can be written this way, where I replace x by its adjoint. And then since j lives in region v and x lives in region u, uh, they commute with each other. x dagger and j commute. So 1, which is this, can also be written like this. The vacuum expectation value of omega times j x dagger x is close to 1. If x were unitary, there would be a contradiction between these two claims. Because if x is unitary, then x dagger x is 1. But the Riesz-Leder theorem does not tell us we can pick x to be unitary. It just tells us there's some x in region U that will create the planet Jupiter in a distant region V. Comparing these formulas, all we find is that in vacuum, the operators j and x dagger x have a non-zero correlation function in the vacuum at space-like separation. But this shouldn't surprise us because, for example, in free field theory, a free field has a non-zero correlation function at space-like separation. So space-like correlators in quantum field theory happen all the time. So there's no contradiction with causality as there would have been if the theorem claimed that x could be assumed to be unitary. Rather, the intuitive interpretation of the Riesz-Leder theorem involves entanglement between the degrees of freedom inside you and those outside you. So to explain our intuitive picture, let's imagine, as uh, Matt Hedrick did this morning somewhat heuristically, that the Hilbert space of our quantum field theory has a factorization as a Hilbert space of degrees of freedom inside you times one of degrees of freedom outside you. That's not exactly true, but let's imagine it was. Then, as we said this morning, any state in the vacuum, in the Hilbert space, such as the vacuum, would have a Schmidt decomposition where we can assume the psi u's and the psi u primes to be ortho orthonormal. We also assume the p's are positive where we would drop some terms from the sum. In general, when we write the vacuum state this way, the psi u's and the psi u primes are not bases because there might not be enough of them. But something like the Riesz-Leder theorem will be true whenever the psi u's and the psi u prime are bases. Let me just show you that quickly. So since the psi u primes are a basis, any state capital psi could be expanded as a sum of psi u primes tensored with something in HU. Now to imitate the Riesz-Leder theorem, I want an operator x that acts only on HU, not on HU prime. That'll turn omega into psi. And that's no sooner said than done. Since the psi's are a basis and the p's are non-zero, you can define an operator x acting on HU 
by saying that it maps the square root of p times psi i u to lambda i. So we found an operator x acting only on degrees of freedom in u such that x omega is psi. So in other words, we've shown that in general in quantum mechanics, whenever you have a state, well, such that the coefficients in the uh, Schmidt decomposition form bases, which is equivalent to saying that the reduced matrix element of either factor is invertible. Whenever that's the case, you have an analog of the riesz leder theorem where every state in Hilbert space can be obtained acting on this given state by an operator that only acts on HU and not on HU prime. And you simply find this operator by hand by comparing the two Schmidt decompositions and asking how you can act on the first factor to turn this into this. You simply want an operator x that maps this vector to this one. Yes? Does the Riesz Leder theorem imply the converse, that there is a full range of decomposition? I think we'll find a yes answer to that question in a second, so let me postpone it. So a state where the p's are all positive and the psi and psi u prime are bases might be called a fully entangled state. It's not really standard terminology, and the reason is that for most applications, it's not useful because it's not interesting to distinguish whether one of the p's is 0 or 10 to the minus 100. But for the kind of considerations in today's lecture, it is useful to speak of a fully entangled state where the analog of the riesz leder theorem applies. Instead, a state is called maximally entangled if the p's are all equal. But this is not possible for Hilbert spaces of infinite dimension, as in quantum field theory. So the riesz leder theorem means intuitively that the vacuum state omega of a quantum field theory is fully entangled in this sense between the inside and outside of an arbitrary open set U. But I want to stress that the decomposition we started with is certainly not literally valid in quantum field theory. If it were, then in the Hilbert space there would be unentangled pure states, psi tensor chi, with psi in the first factor and chi in the second. But that's not the situation in quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, there is a universal ultraviolet divergence in the entanglement entropy that was described in Hedrick's lecture this morning. The entanglement entropy of degree in the vacuum between degrees of freedom in U and those outside U is ultraviolet divergence. And the leading ultraviolet divergence is universal. That is, it's the same for any state. The leading divergence is universal because any state looks like the vacuum at short distances. Now we're going to discuss a corollary of the riesz leder theorem. So now we let, consider two space-like separated open sets in space-time, curly U and curly V. Let B be an operator supported in V. Suppose it annihilates the vacuum. Well, if A is supported in U, then, then A and B commute because they're space-like separated. So B of A omega would be A of B omega, but that's zero because B omega is zero. So if B annihilates the vacuum, it annihilates all states of the form A omega. But the states A omega are dense in H according to riesz leder so B identically vanishes. Thus, if B is supported in an open set V that's space-like separated from U, small enough so that it's space-like separated from U, then B on omega can't be 0. If B on omega was 0, we'd prove using riesz leder that, that B is 0. The roles of U and V are symmetrical, so also for any A non-zero supported in U, A on the vacuum isn't zero. So that's the corollary of riesz leder First, it says that A on, that you can make a dense set of states by acting on the vacuum with operators in a small open set U. And the corollary says that such an operator can't annihilate the vacuum. <coughs> 
Now let A sub U be the algebra of operators in region U. We've proved two facts about how this algebra acts in the vacuum sector. Well, the, one is the riesz leader theorem that states A omega are dense in H. The jargon is that omega is what's called a cyclic vector for the algebra A sub U. This is the definition of that statement. Second is the corollary that if A is non-zero in this algebra, then A does not annihilate the vacuum. That's described by saying that omega is a separating vector for A sub U. So in short, the riesz leader theorem and its corollary say that the vacuum is a cyclic separating vector for the algebra of operators in any small open set U. So I want to go back to the case of a quantum system with a tensor product Hilbert space just to get, give intuition about what cyclic separating means. So let A be the algebra of operators on the first factor. So if the quantum field theory Hilbert space did factorize as a Hilbert space inside times a Hilbert space outside, then the operators on the first factor would just be the operators in region U. But in finite dimensional quantum mechanics, we can just let A be the operators on, on H1. Now, a general vector with its Schmidt decomposition of this form is cyclic for A if the psi 2s are a basis for H2, and it's separating if the psi 1 are a basis. So um, this assertion is very similar to things I already said. But you see, if you take an operator that only acts on the first factor to annihilate psi, it would have to annihilate each of these. But because they form a basis, that operator would actually have to annihilate all of H1. In other words, it would be 0. And that's the separating property. And the cyclic property I essentially explained a few moments ago when I explained that the analog of riesz leader holds in this situation if psi 1 and psi 2 are bases. So in short, the riesz leader theorem and its corollary corresponds in ordinary quantum mechanics to a situation where the uh, vectors in the Schmidt decomposition form bases of the respective states or equivalently, where the density matrix of either factor is invertible. Uh, I think by now I answered one or two questions that I postponed. But anyway, I can stop here for more questions. Yes? So what if the Hilbert space was written as H1 tensor H2 tensor H3 or more factors, and we were interested in generalizing these statements to conditions for this a state being cyclic with respect to the algorithm just acting on H1? That makes perfect sense because I didn't say anything. The question is, could H2 be a tensor product of two other spaces? So in everything I've said, then yes. Uh, any other questions? Yes? Um, can you illuminate the terms cyclic and separating where they came from? Well, they're jargon used by people in operator algebras, which is a subject I don't know well. But separating is semi-intuitive. Uh, 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 an operator maps the vacuum to some other state. I mean, if it always does that, it's separating. But I can't, I cannot give a good answer. The question was where the term cyclic and separating come from. And I have to plead ignorance, I'm afraid. So that completes part one of the lecture. Now we're going to discuss entanglement in quantum field theory. But at a more abstract level than you heard about this morning from uh, Hedrick. So a mathematical machinery that can be useful to analyze entanglement when the Hilbert space is not factorized is called Tamita Takasaki theory. So it applies whenever one has an algebra A that acts on a Hilbert space H with a cyclic separating vector. So we just proved that that's true in quantum field theory if A is the algebra of operators in any open set. So the starting point in Tamita Takasaki theory is this. You're given an algebra A with a cyclic separating vector psi. Then you define an antilinear operator, the Tamita operator S sub psi, that acts from the Hilbert space to itself. You define it by saying that S psi on A psi is A dagger psi for any element A of the algebra. Now, the definition makes sense because of the separating property. 
If you could have a psi equals zero, but a dagger psi non-zero, you'd get a contradiction. But the separating property means that a psi is never zero, so you don't run into that problem. And the definition defines S psi on a dense set of states in Hilbert space because of the cyclic property. We only defined S psi on states A psi, but states A psi are dense in H. So we defined an operator on a dense subset of Hilbert space. The reason we explained the riesz leader theorem first was partly to explain why quantum field theory is high, so highly entangled from a different point of view but it was also to know that Tamita Takasaki theory applies. So a couple obvious facts from the definition are that SI squared is one. So in particular, SI is invertible. Also, if A is one, then A dagger is one. So SI leaves psi invariant. The modular operator is a linear self adjoint operator defined as S dagger S. By the way, the adjoint of an antilinear operator was unfamiliar to me, so here's the definition. So delta psi is positive definite because psi is invertible. Now we're also going to need the relative modular operator. So we let the state psi be cyclic separating as before, and we let phi be any other state. The relative to meta operator is an antilinear operator defined by exactly the same formula as before, except that the right-hand side has a dagger psi, a phi instead of a dagger psi. Again, the well-definedness of the definition depends on the fact that psi is cyclic separating. But no property of phi is needed, so phi can be anything. Usually, we assume that psi and phi are unit vectors. We don't have to, but it's convenient to assume psi and phi are unit vectors. And then the relative modular operator is again defined as S dagger S. It's still self-adjoint and positive semi-definite, but it might not be invertible. If phi equals psi, it reduces to the previous operator. So now we're ready to define relative entropy in quantum field theory. So we fix an open set U, small enough so that the vacuum is cyclic separating for U. That just means that U is space-like separated from some other open set. And we consider the algebra A sub U. Let psi be any cyclic separating vac vector for A sub U, for example, the vacuum, and phi any other vector. So the relative entropy between the state psi and phi for measurements in region U, as defined by Araki, is the matrix expectation value in the state psi of minus the logarithm of the relative modular operator. Now, it's not immediately obvious that this has anything to do with relative entropy as defined in this morning's lecture. <laughs> Actually, I, I didn't correct this after the schedule was changed, so I had to give two lectures today. But we'll later see this definition reduces to the more familiar one for the case of an ordinary quantum system. For now, we'll just proceed and explore this definition. So first, let's discuss positivity properties of this definition. First of all, if phi is psi, then delta psi on psi is psi. So the logarithm of delta psi on psi is 0. And plugging that in here, we find that the relative entropy between psi and itself is 0. I'll just make an assertion that I won't explain. Suppose that phi is obtained from psi by a unitary operator in a space-like separated region, so that measurements in region U cannot distinguish phi from psi. Then you'd like the relative entropy 
to still be zero, and that's again true. It's an exercise where you can look it up uh, in the, well, in my article on the subject. Now consider a completely general state phi. So for, for a positive real number, you've got this nice inequality, which says that the function minus log lambda is convex. And for operators, it implies a corresponding inequality. You see, such an inequality for operators follows from what it is for numbers, because if you diagonalize delta, you also would diagonalize log delta. And then comparing diagonal matrix elements and using this, you find this. So the relative entropy between psi and phi in region U is the matrix element of minus log delta, but that's equal to or bigger than the matrix element of one minus delta. So that's the, the one is just the inner product of psi with itself. And the other one from the definition of delta is this, which from the definition of S is the inner product of phi with itself. And since the two states are both normalized, each matrix element is one, so the difference is zero. So because of this inequality, that proves that the relative entropy is non-negative. So we gave another proof of positivity of relative entropy in the first lecture, but we don't yet know that they were proving the same thing. We'll only learn that later when we learn that uh, the two definitions of relative entropy are the same for an ordinary quantum system. Now let's consider a smaller set U tilde inside U. So now we have two different algebras, AU, the algebra of operators in U, AU tilde, the algebra of operators in a smaller open set. So we have two different relative modular operators and two different modular, two different Tomita operators and two different relative modular operators. So now then also we have two different relative entropies. The relative entropy for measurements in region U is a matrix element of one minus log delta in the state psi. And the corresponding relative entropy for measurements in the smaller region is the matrix element of the other minus log delta. So we want to prove that relative entropy is monotonic under increasing the region considered in the sense that the relative entropy is bigger for the bigger region. So this is an important statement in applications, for instance, in the proof of the generalized second law of thermodynamics for black holes. We'll keep the state psi and phi fixed in this discussion. So to lighten the notation, I'll omit a lot of subscripts and just label the operators by the region, not by the states. The main point of the proof is to show that as an operator, delta u tilde is bigger than delta u. As I'll explain in a moment, this implies that log delta u tilde is bigger than log delta u. The inequality we want is just the matrix element of this inequality in the state psi. So uh, we want to, but I now will take a moment to go from here to here. So we want to show that if P and Q are positive self adjoint operators and P is equal to or bigger than Q, then log P is equal to or bigger than log Q. So we actually make an argument similar to one this morning. Uh, we let R of T be a linear combination interpolation between P and Q with the, where T ranges from zero to one. So therefore R is an increasing function of T in the sense that R dot which is Q minus P, or P minus Q, is positive. And log R can be written this way, a formula we also used this morning. So by D, D by DT of log R is this, which we again used this morning. And the integrand is positive because it's BAB with A and B positive. Here are A and B. So it's an integral of positive things, so it's positive. <coughs> 
and therefore d by dt of log r is positive. So r of 1 is equal to or bigger than r of 0, or log p is equal to or bigger than log q. So we've proved that if p is bigger than q, then log p is bigger than log q, which, was the, which is the, the main step. Um, if we know this, then monotonicity of relative entropy follows. If you think what we proved was obvious, let me remark that if p is bigger than q, it doesn't follow that p squared is bigger than q squared. True for numbers, but not for operators. And on the other hand, the function p going to log p is better. Well, that's the one we needed. Just for fun, let me also remark that if p squared is bigger than q squared, then p is bigger than q. That is true for operators. So monotonicity of relative entropy under increasing this region considered will follow from an inequality that the modular operator gets bigger when the region is smaller. If you try to understand this inequality, you might get confused at first. So delta u is s dagger s for region u, and delta u tilde is s dagger s for region u tilde. But the two s's were defined naively by the same formula, with the sole difference that a is in one algebra in one case, and in a bigger algebra in the other case. So the two opera, well, the algebra AU is bigger, so SU is defined on more states. That's the only difference between them. But the states on which SU tilde is defined are dense in Hilbert space, because state, according to Riesz-Leder, states A psi with A in the smaller algebra are dense. So actually, SU and SU tilde coincide on a dense set of states. So if you're too careless, you might assume that that meant that they were essentially the same operator. But that's not true for unbounded operators. You have to remember that an unbounded operator is never defined on all states in Hilbert space, only at most on a dense subspace. The proper statement is that SU is an extension of SU tilde. It's defined whenever SU tilde is defined, and they coincide on states in which they're both defined. In our problem, SU is a proper extension because there are states A psi that are not of the, with A in the big algebra that are not A psi with A in the small algebra. Anyway, the fact that SU is an extension of SU tilde implies as a general Hilbert space statement that one S dagger S is bigger than the other one, which is what we need for monotonicity of relative entropy. The intuitive idea of the inequality is that the fact that S U tilde is defined on fewer states than S U corresponds to a constraint that's been placed on the wave functions in the case of S U tilde. And in quantum mechanics, a constraint on the wave functions always raises the energy that is the value of S dagger S. So I'll give an analogy that aims to make this obvious. Instead of SU, we'll consider the exterior derivative mapping functions on a manifold to one forms. But I'll assume the manifold has a boundary n, and we'll consider two different versions of the operator. The first will be the derivative acting on differentiable functions that are required to vanish on the boundary. I'll call this d hat. The second, which I'll call d, is the same operator with no constraint that f vanishes on the boundary. Now, functions that vanish on the boundary are dense in Hilbert space, so the two operators are each defined on a dense subspace. And obviously, d is an extension of d hat because it's defined when d hat is defined, and they agree when they're both defined. So the relationship is analogous to the relationship between the modular op the Tamita operators SU and SU tilde for two different regions. Associated to d hat is the Dirichlet Laplacian, d hat dagger d hat. Associated in the same way to d is the Neumann Laplacian, d dagger d. The Dirichlet Laplacian is the Laplacian on functions that vanish on the boundary. The other one is on functions that aren't required to vanish on the boundary. But the Dirichlet Laplacian is more positive than the Neumann Laplacian because of the constraint that the wave function should vanish on the boundary. 
One way to see it is this. The Neumann Laplacian is associated to this energy function, the integral of grad, grad f squared over m. But to get the Neumann Laplacian, you need to add a boundary term that will make the wave function vanish on the boundary. The Neumann Laplacian is associated to this energy function. Did I contradict this? Slide? This is meant to be Neumann. The Neumann Laplacian is associated to this energy function with no constraint on the vanishing on the boundary. But if you want the Dirichlet boundary condition, you need to add a term to the energy that will make the wave function vanish on the boundary. So to get the Dirichlet Laplacian, we add a boundary term. And one way to do it is to consider a family where you add t times the boundary integral of f squared as a boundary term to the energy. And then the operator delta t will be an increasing function of t because the term I've added to the energy is positive and increases with t. For t equals 0, delta t is the Neumann Laplacian. But for t going to infinity, delta t goes over to the Dirichlet Laplacian. So the Dirichlet Laplacian is bigger than the Neumann Laplacian, which is analogous to our desired delta u tilde being bigger than delta u. More informally, a constraint on the state can only raise the energy. <coughs> so uh, by the way, uh, if you look in the written version of this lecture, you'll find a rigorous proof of this statement. But I decided to spend the time today giving the analogy that would aim to make it obvious rather than the rigorous proof. They take roughly the same amount of time. But I thought for a first pass it was more beneficial to see the analogy rather than the rigorous proof. Also, when we get to finite dimensional quantum mechanics, we will give the rigorous proof. To make sure the analogy is clear, delta u tilde is the operator for this energy function for a state lambda in the domain of su tilde. The other one is associated to this energy function for a state in the larger domain. So their relation, the, the second energy function is the same as the first, but it's defined on a larger space of states. You can get the second from, you can get the first from the second, sorry, yeah, this sentence is backwards. You can get the first from the second by a constraint that removes some states. Such a constraint can only increase the energy so delta u tilde is bigger than delta u, just like the relation between the Neumann and Dirichlet Laplacians. Now I'm going to give another analogy, this time in finite dimensions. And the reason for this analogy is that it will be useful to give the proof in finite dimensions. So we let x be an n by m by n by m positive Hermitian matrix, but we write it in block form as I've done there, with blocks of the obvious sizes. A is n by n, C is m by m. And now for positive lambda, I let x lambda be the same thing, except I add lambda in the lower right block. Well, going from lambda 0 to infinity will be like going from Neumann to Dirichlet. For lambda going to infinity, Suppose we try to calculate 1 over s plus x lambda, where s is a positive number. Well, for lambda going to infinity, these lower right elements have such big energy that they won't contribute. So 1 over s plus x lambda will go over to 1 over s plus a. And if we differentiate 1 over s plus x lambda, we find that it's of the form minus c dc with c and d positive, so it's negative. d by d lambda of 1 over s plus x lambda is negative. Uh, I could have just argued that x lambda is increasing, so uh, therefore 1 over s plus x lambda is decreasing as a function of lambda. But since that kind of thing is not always true for operators, I went through that argument. So for any state psi, 1 over s plus x is bigger than 1 over s plus x lambda. And now let's evaluate this for the state psi 0 that only has upper components. So this inequality gives this statement. But on the last slide, we had this limiting statement 
So as lambda goes to infinity, we learn that the matrix element of 1 over s plus x is bigger than the matrix element of 1 over s plus a. And when we integrate from 0 to infinity, we find that the matrix element of log x in this state, psi in the big space, is no bigger than the matrix element of log, no less, sorry, no bigger than log a in the state little psi in the small space. So that's a relationship that's analogous to the one between delta of the two different regions in quantum field theory. And we'll use it in a similar way. So when we get to finite dimensional quantum mechanics, we'll use this inequality to prove monotonicity of relative entropy, imitating the proof we had in quantum field theory. And in that case, we actually will give the rigorous proof in the sense that I explained the rigorous proof of this statement. To state this inequality more elegantly, to find a unitary embedding from Cn to Cn plus m that takes psi to the state capital psi, psi zero. So psi, by definition, is u times little psi. And, the mat and therefore, the matrix element of log x in the state capital psi is its matrix element in the state u psi, which is the same state. And then bringing u dagger and u outside of the states, that's equal to this. But since A is likewise u dagger x u, our inequality becomes this one. That's an inequality for finite matrices that, well, following Petz and Nielsen, we'll use to prove monotonicity of relative entropy in quantum field theory. Uh, sorry, in quantum mechanics. So that completes part two. But maybe I'll stop for more questions. Yes? So you, if I understood correctly, we are assuming the full field theory is in a pure state. <coughs> I presented it that way, but it really didn't matter. No. Um, um, I wrote the matrix element of log delta in the state psi, but that could have been the trace of rho times log delta, where rho is a density matrix on the full quantum field theory. And then the same inequality would have led to the same statement. Sorry, I didn't repeat the question. The question was, I had assumed that the full quantum field theory was in a, pure, in a pure state in the way I wrote it. What happens if the full quantum field theory is in a mixed state? And the answer is the same proof would work with the change in notation, where the matrix element in the state psi is replaced by a trace with an insertion of the density matrix. But that's not a density matrix for a subregion, which only exists as an idealization. That's a density matrix for the full quantum field theory, which would exist in an honest sense. Uh, any other questions? Well, the, <laughs> see, that's hidden in my statement that it's a density. The question is, is there a problem with convergence? So I didn't chop anything off at any point, including the answer to that question. I interpreted the question to mean the full quantum field theory is in a mixed state, meaning there are two quantum field theory states, psi 1 and psi 2 which might be orthogonal. And with probabilities P1 or P2, the system is in a state psi 1 or psi 2. And then monotonicity of relative entropy will be true for that mixed state if it's true for psi 1 and psi 2 separately. And we essentially proved it for both. Wait, but, but is there a defined relative modular operator, or do I have two different relative modular operators? Well, what your question, the question is, what is the relative modular operator we use when it's a mixed state? We would use the same, the same operator, precisely the same operator as in the, so when I wrote psi log delta psi, that would just go over to the trace of rho times log delta. But rho is a density matrix on the full quantum field theory. So what rho means is something like this, the sum of pi times states psi i, psi i, where psi i are states of the full quantum field theory. They're not states of subregions. That's what your question referred to, in my understanding of it. OK, any other questions? Yes?
I missed a couple words. So, I mean, to, to, to simulate this cyclic state, I can only understand it if, the, if, your, if your subsystem and the complementary part have the same dimension. And then the, 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 well, the question here, at least, cyclic separating in finite dimensions refers to two states that have the same dimension because the vectors in the Schmidt decomposition had to be bases of both states that form both spaces, which forced them to have the same dimension. In quantum field theory, the dimensions are infinite, so they're the same. They're both separably infinite. Yes? Is it obvious how you would define Douglas and Rowan in that you wrote it in terms of the S, which acted on the middle? Log delta, I didn't write a delta sub rho. Log, ah, sorry. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah, I have to give a better answer, right? Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, allow me to cheat slightly in answering you. I'll introduce a purification. So, so I'll take I'll take C n, a finite dimensional space or a Hilbert space maybe. I'll take C n tensored with the Hilbert space of the quantum field theory. And then we'll proceed as before. The algebra we'll use is the algebra of matrices on the auxiliary space. Uh, the algebra generated by the operators in the small region together with the matrices in the auxiliary space. And then we'd say all the same things. Okay, sorry, my answer, the f thank you for persisting. My answer the first time around wasn't completely correct. Uh, uh, maybe one more quick question if there is one. Yes? Um, related question, I think. If our Tamina operator is only defined for a cyclic separating state, yes. then it would seem that we can only find the relative entropy Okay, this is a very good question. So the Tamita operator is defined for a cyclic separating state. So therefore, have we proved monotonicity only for a special class of states? So there's something which is actually quite easy to prove, and you can find it in the written article that corresponds to this talk, but I didn't explain it, which is that I proved that the vacuum is cyclic separating, but actually a dense subspace of Hilbert space consists of cyclic separating states. So. Uh, therefore, the proof, if you like, is for a dense subspace of Hilbert space, but that's good enough to imply it for all states. That was a good question. Thank you. Well, the question is whether we can get somewhere by extending by zero. I don't want to make a quick claim in answer to that. So I'll go on instead to the third part of the lecture. So I've explained what I regard as the most transparent explanation of monotonicity of relative entropy. But as stated, it's not general enough. As stated, it only applies to the special case of increasing the size of a region in space-time. If we had general monotonicity of relative entropy under partial trace, this would imply strong subadditivity of entropy. We showed that this morning. And that, in turn, has had numerous applications in quantum field theory, of which I guess the first uh, was the cassini huerta proof of the C theorem in two dimensions. But this requires monotonicity of relative entropy in general, not just under increasing the size of a region. So what I want to do now is to consider a general quantum system, which for simplicity we'll take to be finite dimensional, but you could consider a non-relativistic quantum mechanics system with an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And we'll imitate the ideas we've discussed up to this point. We'll define the Tamita Takasaki operators and we'll fill a gap by explaining how the two definitions of relative entropy coincide. And then we'll imitate the proof of monotonicity that I just explained and arrive at a general proof of monotonicity under partial trace. This proof is largely due to Petz and Nielsen. So we start with a finite dimensional Hilbert space H that's a tensor product, H1 tensor H2, where H1 and H2 are Hilbert spaces of the same dimension N. We let A be the algebra of N by N matrices acting on H1. So an element A of the algebra acts on H by A tensor 1. In other words, it acts as A on the first factor and has the identity on the second factor. 
An arbitrary vector, psi and h, has a decomposition, the Schmidt decomposition that we discussed this morning. And uh, we sometimes abbreviate j tensor k prime as j comma k inside a single ket. So we'll assume psi is a unit vector, and likewise later phi will be a unit vector. By now we know that psi is cyclic separating for the algebra if and only if the ck are all non-zero. This is true for a generic vector, which by the way is analogous to what I said in quantum field theory in answer to the last question, where it was pointed out that our proof had only been for cyclic separating vectors. But in quantum mechanics it's obvious that the generic vector, if the two spaces have the same dimension, is cyclic separating. The definition of the modular operator is the same as before but now applied to this different algebra. Now we want to get a concrete formula for the modular operator. So we pick values i and j, and we let a be the elementary matrix that acts by annihilating all vectors other than k, and it maps, on, it maps i to j. So that elementary matrix, or elementary matrices of that kind for different i and j, give a, a basis for the space of n by n matrices. The adjoint acts in the opposite fashion. So on our state psi that we assume to be like so, A tensor 1 acts by turning I into J and killing everything else. And A dagger tensor 1 turns J into I and kills everything else. And the definition of SI then says that it's supposed to map this vector to this vector. But since these vectors are a basis of the full space, which basically is the cyclic property again, that completely determines SI. And using the fact that SI is antilinear, which we have to remember when we move out C to get it outside and move it over here, we get this nice formula for how SI acts on an arbitrary basis vector. And then uh, given this, we can get its adjoint, the only problem being to remember the definition of the adjoint of an antilinear operator. And then the modular operator, S dagger S, also gets a nice formula, which explicitly shows that it's positive in the case of a cyclic separating vector. So that's the modular operator in the finite dimensional case. Now we're also going to need the relative modular operator, but we describe it in the same way. Another vector phi in H would have an expansion like this. With orthonormal bases alpha and alpha prime that in general are different from the ones that appear in the formula for psi. It's more convenient to make two different Schmidt decompositions in two different bases rather than referring everything to the same basis. We abbreviate alpha beta for alpha tensor beta, and likewise, for any pair of vectors in the different bases. So now, the definition of the relative modular operator is this, and we can compute it directly from its definition. So first, we pick i and alpha in the set from 1 to n, and we define an operator in the algebra by saying it maps i to alpha and annihilates j for any other j. So this is, these operators also form a basis for the n by n matrices, although it's a different basis from the one we used earlier. And then a dagger does this. So with this psi and this phi, we find that a tensor 1 on psi is this, and a dagger tensor 1 on phi is that. And we're supposed to get that s on this vector should equal this vector. So that tells us how s acts on a vector alpha comma i. But vectors of the type alpha comma i form a basis of the Hilbert space, so that completely determines the, the action of s psi phi. And we can also work out the adjoint, and therefore we can work out s dagger s, which is the relative modular operator. Now, I don't want to belabor these formulas too much, but I do want to say that they're very simple if you're willing to use different, ba different bases in different equations. Uh, 
If you try to refer everything to the same basis, which might be your first thought, it would become very messy. But if you're willing to use two, the two different bases that are natural for the two different vectors and use in each formula the basis vector that makes that formula look better, then all the formulas are simple. Now, to make contact between the two definitions of relative entropy, we have to express the relative modular operator in terms of density matrices. So we need to work out the reduced density matrices. The reduced density matrix of this state, well, it's reduced density matrices, plural, are these. We actually had them in the first lecture. And the reduced mat density matrix matrices of this state are similarly these. So if you compare these formulas to what we had for the relative modular operator, you'll learn that the relative modular operator, well, the ordinary modular operator is row 1 tensor row 2 inverse, and the relative one is sigma 1 tensor row 2 inverse. So you probably won't catch that completely the first time you see it. I mean, you'll need to work through these formulas yourself. But the point is that if you compute the density matrices and also compute <coughs> the modular operator, all of which are quite straightforward computations, you'll find that the relative modular operator can be written in terms of density matrices. So now we can compare Araki's definition of relative entropy to the one we had in today, this morning's lecture. So the formula for delta psi phi leads to, well, actually a formula we used in a different context this morning, the log of delta psi phi is a sum of logarithms of density matrices. So S psi phi with Araki's definition, <clears throat> well, it's the matrix element of minus this plus this. It's a sum of two terms. And each is a matrix that acts in only one factor in the two Hilbert spaces. And you know if you're trying to calculate a matrix element of an operator that acts in only one factor, you're supposed to take a partial trace to reduce to the factor at axon. So after taking partial traces to reduce this one to a trace in H1 and this to a trace in H2, that replaces psi by row 1 here and it replaces psi by row 2 over here. But we also use the fact that the entropy of row 2 is the same as the entropy of row 1 because a system and its purifying system have the same entropy. So finally, we get a formula for Araki's relative entropy that looks like this. And that's the usual definition in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. I assume that this was Araki's motivation because this definition in non-relativistic quantum mechanics was given earlier by Umazaki. <clears throat> Now, two remarks about this. Since the two definitions are equivalent, well, the proof we gave of positivity of relative entropy in the, to, in the lecture now makes sense verbatim and can be, serve as a substitute for the one this morning. And I think it's interesting that the two definitions agree. One was motivated by classical probability theory, one by non-commutative algebras, but they nicely agree. So any questions before I move on to discuss um, monotonicity? Yes? Uh, what is the next operator in terms of bring this theory the window What is what? What is the S, uh, SU in terms of bring the theory the window That's supposed to be my, the question is what is the modular operator in the Rindler space? It's supposed to be my fourth topic today, but that's very optimistic. So I'm not making any promises. Now, uh, it's also related to what, uh, well, anyway, I better go on. So as discussed in this morning's lecture, for monotonicity of relative entropy, we consider a bipartite system with the Hilbert space HA tensor HB, which is going to replace what so far has been H1. And it has two density matrices, rho AB and sigma AB. And we could 
further reduce the density matrices by partial traces on HB to get rho A and sigma A. And we want to prove that the relative entropy on AB is bigger than the relative entropy on A. So we're going to imitate this, the proof we gave in quantum field theory. So the proof we gave in quantum field theory involved looking at a pure state on a doubled system. Maybe the state of the whole quantum field theory was the pure state of the doubled system. So we start by doubling the Hilbert space, so we, which will play the role analogous to H1 tensor H2. So what so far has been H1 is promoted to HAB. What has been H2 is now H prime AB, a second copy of AB, HAB. So we can purify rho AB and sigma AB by deriving them as reduced density matrices from pure states psi AB and phi AB. Likewise, psi A and phi A are reduced density matrices for some states in HA tensor HA prime. We can assume that psi AB and psi A are cyclic separating because we know a generic vector has that property. Now, in quantum field theory, we had a small algebra AU tilde and a larger algebra AU. In the present discussion, the analog of AU tilde is going to be the algebra A sub A of matrices on H sub A, acting on the first factor of HA tensor HA prime. In other words, as earlier today, an element of the algebra acts on this product by acting with A sub A tensor 1. The analog of A sub U is going to be the algebra A sub AB of matrices on HAB, acting similarly on the first factor of this tensor product. So just as in quantum field theory, we have two algebras, and we're going to compare the modular operators of the two algebras. Now, in quantum field theory, one algebra was naturally a subalgebra of the other. One algebra consisted of operators in one region. The other algebra was the operators in a bigger region. The analog of this is that there's a natural embedding of the smaller algebra and the big algebra. Namely, I'll call the embedding phi. It maps A to A tensor 1. A acts on Hilbert space H sub A. A tensor 1 acts on Hilbert space H sub A tensor H sub B or HAB. In quantum field theory, I didn't really have to mention the embedding because it came for free. Here, we have to mention the embedding of one algebra and the other. Also, in quantum field theory, the small algebra and the large one naturally acted on the same Hilbert space, which was the Hilbert space of the quantum field theory. In the present context, the small algebra acts on this space, and the big algebra acts on this space. So the algebras act on different spaces. But there's a natural embedding of the smaller map to the larger one, namely the map that maps A on psi A to phi of A on psi AB. Remember, psi A and psi AB were the two purifying vectors. And psi A was cyclic separating. So A on psi A is a basis of all states in the small Hilbert space. So this formula defines a map from the small Hilbert space to the big one. States like this are a basis of this space. So this formula gives a map from this space to this space. Now, it's a well-defined linear map because psi A is cyclic separating. And a small calculation shows it's a unitary embedding. In quantum field theory, we didn't have to do that computation because the two Hilbert spaces were the same. Here, the two Hilbert spaces weren't really the same, but we embed one and the other, and we have to check that it's a unitary embedding. A small calculation also shows the relation between the two modular operators, which says, you see, one modular operator acts on the small space and one acts on the big space. But if you use U to map with the small space to the big one, then act with the big modular operator and then map back, that's the same as the modular operator of the small space. So what this says is that delta A and delta AB have the same matrix elements to the extent you know how to compare them. That's the analog in quantum field theory of the fact that one operator was an extension of the other, roughly.
So one has to check this, but it's another short calculation. So then, using our inequality from the end of part two of this current lecture, or this was our inequality, and that inequality applied for an arbitrary unitary map, unitary embedding of one Hilbert space in another. So we simply use that inequality for this unitary embedding, and it gives what we want, because you see, the small relative entropy was a matrix element of log delta A, but delta A is U dagger delta ABU, so this equals this. And the inequality says what will happen if we move U outside the logarithm, so we get this with an inequality. And then we move U into the states and turn psi, but U on psi A is psi AB from the definition, and that's the big relative entropy. So we learn monotonicity of relative entropy under partial trace. And this morning, we basically learned that that also implies monotonicity of relative entropy under a general quantum channel. So basically, this proof is the same as in the quantum field theory case, except we have to check a couple of details that in the quantum field theory case were obvious because the two Hilbert spaces were the same and one algebra was literally defined as a subalgebra of the other. Does this proof depend on tricky details or is it obvious that it would have to work? Opinions could differ, but philosophically, you might believe that since quantum field theory isn't simpler than quantum mechanics, whatever worked in quantum field theory should have an analog for a general quantum system. Okay, I'll stop here for questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, the question is, to what extent is there a gap between the rigorous theory and what physicists actually do in practice? So there's definitely a gap, a very important gap, because physicists have gotten important results, such as the proof of the C theorem, with considerations that are not yet rigorous mathematically, roughly because they involve entropy rather than relative entropy. They involve linear combinations of entropies that are well-defined, but haven't been put in a rigorous framework. So I explained the part of the story, monotonicity under, partial, under changing the size of a region of the relative entropy that is rigorous mathematically, or a part of the story that's rigorous. But in the physics literature, there definitely are extremely important applications of entropy in quantum field theory that go beyond what's rigorous. That's actually why I explained the general proof in quantum mechanics. Because the general proof in quantum mechanics applied to quantum field theory gives a lot of interesting and important results, which, as far as I know, one doesn't know how can't be gotten by direct arguments in quantum field theory. So the most elementary of those is the proof of the C theorem, but there are numerous others. Any other questions quickly? Yes? So uh, you can say you're a physicist and you don't have to answer this, but I think uh, the, there's also the question of can you proving the relativity uh, rel uh, um, the monotonicity of relative entropy for general von Neumann algebras, which I think even in Iraqi in his paper is not able to do it. I guess there are some later papers that maybe they do it. But I'm just curious to what extent quantum field theory is a special case of the general. I thought he could do it for general. Yeah, I believe you're. Mis I think Aaron's correct. But I think not in Iraqi's paper. Uh, I think Aaron is correct, but let's not discuss that right now. Uh, I won't answer the question because there's a factual issue about which there's some uncertainty. Uh, I think I'll go on. So by my watch, which uh, is digital, so I think it's slightly more trustworthy than that. They only disagree by two minutes. I have 11 minutes left, and I think it would be more satisfying to give a brief version of part four than to skip it completely. Although, to tell you the truth, it's a little bit tempting to finish the first lecture instead, but anyway, I think we've got the slides handy to, for a brief discussion of part four. Well, going back to quantum field theory, in general, for a state psi in a region U, uh, 
it's very hard to identify concretely the corresponding modular operator. But there's one very important case where this can be done, and this example is very important for applications. In fact, it was briefly mentioned this morning by Matt Hedrick. That occurs if U is a Rindler space or a wedge in Minkowski spacetime, and psi is the vacuum state omega. So the Rindler wedge is defined by the condition in the xt plane, where x is one spatial coordinate, that x is bigger than t. Sorry, this should have been that x is bigger than the absolute value of t. I put the absolute value in the wrong place. So transverse coordinates y will not play an important role, and I'll suppress them. So there's a rigorous proof due to Bisignano and Wickman based on holomorphy. Uh, and actually, you can read a two-page summary of it in my notes. But today, I'll explain a well-known path integral proof that's based on the approximation of thinking of the Hilbert space as factorizing as h left tensor h right, where the two Hilbert spaces live in the two Rindler wedges. So h right is the Hilbert space over here. h left is the Hilbert space over here. So first of all, we continue to Euclidean time tau. And we use the fact that the quantum vacuum state on the surface tau equals 0 can be computed by a path integral in the lower half space. So we do a path integral in the gray region, which is meant to be the negative half tau space. And this is the x-axis, and that's the point 0 where we'll separate the two Rindler wedges. So the green dot is supposed to be at x equals 0, and it's supposed to be to extend in the y direction. So the green dot really represents an entangling surface in Hedrick's terminology. It defines the initial value surface in left and right halves. We're going to assume a corresponding factorization of the Hilbert space. <clears throat> so assuming that, we'll find a density matrix for the right half space. So for this, we think of the vacuum wave function as a functional that depends on field variables in the left and right half spaces. Phi left are variables on the left. Phi right are variables on the right. A density matrix would then be a function of pairs of variables. The, um, the bra depends on phi left and phi right, and the cat depends on another set of variables, phi left prime and phi right prime. That's the density matrix for the vacuum. A partial, a partial trace over h left to get the density matrix is obtained, as always, by setting the unobserved variables equal in the bra and the cat, and integrating or summing over them. So we set phi left equals phi left prime, and we integrate over phi left. So this corresponds to a simple path integral procedure. I can't remember if I wrote something about it. Oh, yeah. To explain this picture in more detail, a path integral on the lower half plane creates the vacuum cat. A path integral on the upper half plane creates the vacuum bra. An integral over field variables on the left of the initial value surface sets phi left equals phi left prime. So finally, the density matrix of the vacuum is represented by a path integral on a Euclidean space with a cut on the right half of the initial value surface, as shown. So the density matrix is a function of two sets of variables on the right half space. One set lives below the cut, one set lives above the cut. To compute the density matrix, you specify those two sets of variables, and you do an integral on the cut, on the cut space time. So then you get a density matrix that depends on two sets of right variables living just above and below the cut. So I'll call the cut space time w sub 2 pi. More generally, you can consider the reason for the notation is this. Let eta be any angle, and then I could consider a wedge. This is, imagine it goes off to infinity. This is a wedge of angle eta. So the wedge is obtained by rotating a half space through an angle eta. The rotation matrix acts on tau and x like this. But we want to express it in terms of real time. So if you define real time where t is minus i tau, the rotation matrix becomes a Lorentz boost with an imaginary boost angle. The generator of a Lorentz boost 
is the integral of x times t0,0 over the initial value surface. Uh, by the way, unlike Hedrick's this morning, my Lorentz boost generator is integrated over the whole space. So this is the full Lorentz boost operator of the quantum field theory. But we can write it as k right minus k left, where k right and k left are partial boost operators. k right boosts the right half space, and k left with the minus sign boosts the left half space. The reason for the minus sign is to ensure that both k left and k right boost their respective wedges forward in time. The operator that implements a Lorentz boost by a real boost angle theta is e to the minus i theta k. So if theta is minus i eta, we find that in real time language, the path integral in the wedge constructs the operator e to the minus eta times k right. The reason for the k right is simply that the wedge is propagating only the right half space through an angle eta. So e to the minus eta times k right is generated by the path integral in the wedge. To get the density matrix of the right half space, we said eta equals 2 pi, because the cut plane is a wedge where the wedge opening angle is 2 pi. So you go around a 2 pi angle. So this is the density matrix of the right half space. And similarly, the density matrix of the left hand space, half space is the same thing with k right and k left, k right replaced by k left. We learned that when the Hilbert space factorizes, the modular operator is row right tends to row left inverse. So in this case, the modular operator is e to the minus 2 pi k right times e to the plus 2 pi k left because of this minus sign. And since k is k right minus k left, the full modular operator is e to the minus 2 pi k. So that's the modular operator for Rindler space. And had we just wanted the density matrix of a half space, it's one of these. The modular operator only involves the well-defined operator k, while the density matrix involves operators that are only well-defined to the extent that there is a factorization. I'm not sure. You know, I could take about four minutes to try to find the Tamita operator. So the Tamita operator is related to the modular operator by delta being S dagger S. Equivalently, oh, sorry. This might be too complicated. I think I'm going to stop here for questions. So if you want to see the Tamita operator and not just the modular operator, you can read about it in the written. Or actually, the transparencies will be on the PITP website. So you can look at the transparencies that I'm skipping. Let me instead stop here for questions. <laughs>